Hello, everyone. All right, and welcome to this iteration of Ask Me Anything. Um, my name is Mike Tanzillo. I am the uh, co-founder here at the Academy of Animated Art. I'm also a lighting artist. Uh, I've been lighting at Blue Sky Studios for over 11 years now, and I like to have these sessions where it just allows you guys during this quarantine time to uh, kind of reach out to somebody that's in the industry, ask us any questions, ask me any questions that you may have um, about a certain topic. So last week we did um, getting your first job and getting into the industry. And today I want to talk to you guys about something a little more specific. And that is with lighting itself. It's character lighting. It's a big thing. It's one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. Um, and I actually went a little nuts because I put a, I put together a presentation and I feel like I've added too much because I usually like to keep these to like a half hour, but we might go over tonight. So let's get right into it. So I know I have some questions for you all, but I do want to, um, to show everyone a uh, just a little presentation that I put together just so we can kind of be on a similar wavelength because what ends up happening is <clears throat> if I, I realize that if, if we don't really get on the same page in terms of what it is that we're talking about in terms of like the terminology and what we're looking for in character lighting then I we really can't ad advance the conversation much further so this is a very quick very 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 condensed um, uh, version of like what we cover in our courses. So um, we have an entire course at the Academy of Anime Art devoted to character lighting. We have lots of characters you can download and light. We've got lots of other topics, but this is just like the super, it's like if you took a, an abridged version and made a synopsis of it and then made a Cliff's Notes version of it, that's what we got today. So just to kind of give, give us underway. So when we're talking about character lighting, the big question is what makes successful character lighting? Um, we're going to talk about uh, creating mood, we're going to talk about visual shaping, and we're going to talk about directing the viewer's eye. Now, these are three things that are important in any lighting scenario, whether it's character lighting, environment lighting, whatever. You have to kind of hit these three things all the time, uh, creating mood, directing the viewer's eye, and visual shaping. We talk about them all the time. So I want to get into it with character lighting. I want to double check in um, the Facebook group here just to make sure. Hey, Clever, how's it going, buddy? Um, so throw your questions in the comment windows down below. I will be checking those after I do the little presentation because as you can see, I'm going full screen. So um, throw in your questions down below there and I will be happy to get to them. All right. So first up, we have uh, creating mood. So when we create mood, um, the big thing that we're trying to do is trying to up the emotions of the scene. This one's actually, it's very, very, very important. Uh, it's probably the most important thing about what we're doing because as lighting artists, we're just like any other artist on a film. We're here to tell a story, right? We're here to um, listen to what the director's vision is, listen to what the storyteller's vision is, and enhance that through the mood, through the color scheme, through the light, through the values, through all that stuff. And I think that's something that you as a, um, as an artist inherently get. So I'm not gonna cover it too much, but like some stuff to think about. So these are relatively two similar subject matters. We've got an, uh, an individual female in a room, not a lot going on in the room, but just judging by their two different lighting scenarios, you can fully uh, adjust the mood of the scene. So on the right, we've got a lot of contrast. We've got a lot of deep shadows. Like look at her screen left eye, super dark shadows on that eye. We don't even see it. So that means like there's something hidden, there's something dark, there's something sinister. Versus the woman on the right, or the woman on the left, there's like barely any shadows at all. She's totally frontally lit. This could be like her driver's license photo. It's soft, all, and the shadows that are there are super soft. Uh, we got bright, colorful uh, colors. We've got a whole thing going on there. So not a lot of difference in subject matter, but just the way that it's approached in the lighting, it's gonna be very different. You can take a look at changing mood over like seasons and, and different times of day. Um, so just by color schemes, just by look, you know, there's only mild differences between these three, three shots, but it's the color scheme. It's the way that the lighting is flowing is going to change our perception and our mood towards those images. One classic example that I always give is from the original Incredibles movie. So you've got Mr. Incredible, right? He starts off as a superhero, then they cut to him later on as he's in this insurance job and it's awful and he hates it. Just look at his skin tone, right? He's, he's, he's a flesh toned uh, character, he's usually much warmer than this, uh, much, much less, um, a lot of like blood in his veins, you know what I mean? 
But in this climate, in this setting, he's super bummed about his job. His job sucks. He's got to tell this old woman she's not covered under insurance or something. And what the artists are doing in this to kind of emphasize that move, to emphasize that he's kind of being drained of life, that this job and this life is just draining him, they really allowed the blue colors of those lights to hit him and kind of sap that energy out of him. And so now he looks gray. He almost looks sick versus at the end of the movie when he's got his family together and they're about to fight the bad guy. Look how much warmer his skin tone is. Like go back and forth here. Such a massive difference between those two elements, right? So just by that like subtle thing, we can really kind of um, change that mood and change that idea. Uh, we can do hero versus villain. Like obviously like a shot like this where the hero is like going towards the light and there's lots of, you know, fill value in the shadow, shadows and there's lots of saturation, lots of good things going on versus something like this. You know, we don't even need to know the stories. We don't even need to know what's going on. Like if I had to tell you, guess who the hero is and guess who the villain is, I think you'd be pretty quick to tell the difference between the two. So you guys know that, you know, creating uh, emotion, that's a pretty straightforward one. Visual shaping is a little bit different. So the medium that we're working in film um, and renders and all that stuff, it's a 2D image, right? It's like a painting or a photograph. And what we need to do is create light to dark fall off and uh, light to dark value differences over that image to give the objects in that image volume, mass, depth, um, like just like, like physically fill up the space so we can kind of see them. And also, we don't want to create flat regions because that looks too CG. It doesn't look uh, super cool. Even in like super stylized stuff like Spider-Verse or something like that, you're still getting variation in tones across certain elements. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Um, so in this example, like what are we talking about when we're talking about shaping? Because I bring it up all the time in my critiques and I just want to make sure we kind of establish it. Because like I said, it's just like a trick of the eye. So we take an image like this, uh, it's just a simple sphere sculpted and it's, it's not a circle, right? We can feel that it's a sphere. We can feel that it has volume and mass to it. And we do that by getting these, these variation in tone. So we've got the, you know, uh, light source coming in from the screen right side. It's hitting the object. You can see it kind of goes from the center light to the half tones, to the core tones, uh, which is the darkest point. And then the reflected light, the light kind of bouncing up underneath it versus the occluded shadow, which is just beneath it and the cast shadow off to the side. We also got the specular highlight, which um, is just a reflection of the light source. Um, so that, that's like the basic, like the most basic shaping thing you can get, like a sphere and just like getting that rounded and getting that rounded feeling so it doesn't look like a circle. One of the masters of shaping in history for character shaping was Rembrandt. Um, and one of the things that Rembrandt was known for was like, you know, he always had like kind of soft shaping across the character, getting that feeling, getting that, um, emotion. And one of the terms that you'll hear on occasion is Rembrandt lighting. And what Rembrandt lighting is, is like lighting at kind of a 45 degree angle, either on either side of the character. Um, again, creating shaping across the forehead, across the chin, across the nose, all that stuff. And one telltale sign that you have Rembrandt lighting is this little triangle. So on a human, light crosses across the bridge of your nose, light kind of crosses over here and then creates like a shadow, a triangle right in there. And you'll see that a lot. And it's not just in Rembrandt's work. That translates into CG images, too. You can kind of see the triangle here in Tintin. Um, now, you don't necessarily see the triangle too much. Maybe you do on Kevin. No, what's the kid, little boy's name? Ah, I'm blanking on the little boy's name. You can kind of see it on him. But judging by the shapes of their faces, you don't always get it. But what you do get is light fall off the, over the nose, across the foreheads. Like, even look against that back wall. There's light falling off from the, the screen right side to the screen left side. So just that overall shaping to give them volume. You can also do it if like values are, are you know, you wanna give some value luminosity differences, but you also can play with uh, saturation. So in Coco here, they use a lot of warm and cool wrap, like just to get that variation, get that uh, volumetric stuff going on. Directing the viewer's eye, getting the audience to focus where we need to focus. Um, lots of times these shots are very short. Uh, I think my record shortest shot was like seven frames or like a quarter of a second. Um, and there are times we need to get the audience to not only focus on the character, but maybe on like a certain element of the character. Like in this example, we're just like focusing in on our eyes. And how do we do that? We do that by creating complementary elements, light over dark, warm over cool, uh, complementary tones. Something, it's just, it's just think about it being different than whatever's behind it and getting that to pop forward. Because our eye is always trying to find contrasting elements. Sure, there's a science reason for that. I don't know what it is, but basically we're always just like looking for contrast and that's where our eye zooms in on. A good way to test 
uh, I learned this um, in photo school, was to uh, squint your eye at an image. And if you kind of squint at it, everything kind of goes blurry and you're able to kind of just pick out shapes and tones. By the way, I'm squinting my eyes now as if you guys can see this, but squint your own eyes. Um, and you can see the kind of the blurriness takes away the, the actual thing that it is and it allows the contrast in this, in this case, that white pixel in the middle to really pop forward. So we know what element is really kind of popping out for us. So a very common one is to use like a, a, a to, to create a darker background behind the character and allow the character's lighter tones to pop forward. You can also do dark over light, like if you have a very bright background. Backgrounds, we have saturation. So if you look at the screen left, we have a full saturated character over a desaturated background versus the screen right where we have complementary saturated values. We have oranges and green tones over, um, uh, or oranges over a green background. So getting those complementary warm over cool. We can use that a little bit more subtly. So from the Peanuts movie, we've got warm tone character over like the green wall. Um, that was something that we had to mess with was getting the characters, uh, the rooms and the rooms that they're in to, to complement their skin tones. One thing also I really like is getting complex shapes versus simple shapes. So a simple, um, the simplicity of the eyes and of the face versus the complexity of the leaves surrounding it. And same deal with Bambi, like check out how um, simple the shapes are in Bambi and, and the possums. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the shapes and the detail in Bambi and the possum versus the simplicity of the background. Like that background is just an abstract painting. It's so beautifully done in Bambi. I would guarantee, um, I never noticed it before when I watched it. Maybe you did, maybe you guys are better than I am. But, um, but just like that, that difference is just really making the characters pop off. And you can also see like the slight lightning up towards the screen right to get the darker possums versus the darkening of the background of the screen left to get, to get Bambi to pop forward off there. Another thing that we can do to direct the viewer's eye is use depth of field. So in this shot, we can, the, the um, uh, artist is using a rack focus to get, to get the audience to really look at the most important part of the image. Because to start the image, you can see the character's face and then the object that he's holding is the most important part here. So uh, then we've got um, emphasizing, oh wait, Okay, so that was the three basically, right? We've got visual shaping, we've got creating mood, and we've got directing the viewer's eye. Now I wanna talk about a few other things that are out, they're not, that are equally as important, but outside of that range of um, creating mood, shaping, and directing the viewer's eye. Um, and one of them is emphasizing a character's shape. So characters in character design and animated films have general shape. They've got, uh, they're either circle tones, like, like Kung Fu Panda or Kirby with a teapot, uh, they can be squares. Square characters are usually um, more solid, more stable. They're usually like leaders and just like big, bulky, stubborn, bullish, uh, unmoving dudes. And, and circle characters are generally more comedic elements. Like they're a little softer, um, they're approachable, uh, they're funny. Um, and you can usually find that in, in the round shape characters. Triangle characters are usually oddballs. They're usually all over the place. They're kind of the wild cards in films. You usually don't make a hero um, a triangle shaped character just because it's a little bit, it's, it's just a little bit different in their design. And characters will often have um, complementary elements. So like in Up, uh, Carl was just, he's all blocky. Like his face is super square, his jaw is super square. And the little kid, he's all round. There's not a sharp corner on that kid. Super soft, super squishy. And again, it kind of feeds into that, that, that idea. Um, Mike Wazowski versus Sully. Sully is the leader. Um, Mike is the comic relief, round versus square. So in your lighting, you kind of want to play up these shapes to really kind of help that uh, hero element of the character read. And that gets us into hero color. So characters often have a hero color, just kind of their um, iconic, like, first main um, color that we want them to read as. So this is Piao. He's one of our characters that uh, we have access to through the school. He's through Boutique 23, which is a great, great company. Um, and Piao, is a, he's a young kid. He's like a little uh, newsboy. And, and what I was doing when I was lighting this was, like, I just wanted to make him feel warm and happy and, like, approachable and, and like he's super soft and so that I lit him up for the screen left side and as an example of how we can mess that up is if you make him cooler tone right like this is just a slight shift in his in his color tone and in, in post 
you can see it totally stops him of that warmth, totally stops him of that energy. His hero warm skin tone is just gone. And we can think of like hero colors are pretty common in characters like the minions. They, they're always kind of maintaining that same yellow color or Shrek, his very, very specific green color. Um, and lots of times these, these colors won't, won't even really fall off the scale even when um, there's like lighting that could adjust it. Like you look at uh, Murata from Brave, she's got her iconic red hair. Look at her in this shot, surrounded by cool desaturated light. It should, you know, like in reality, it would kind of sop out some of that color, but they allowed that vibrancy, that hero color to stick because that's what we're known for. That's kind of her iconic element. Uh, this was a shot I did from Rio. This is from the, the was this Rio 2? No, this is the first Rio. So we've got blue on the right side and jewel on the left side. And one of the things that we always, always, always needed to be aware of was because the story is they're like the last two blue macaws in the world, but we needed to identify them quickly. And in this scene, this is a chase sequence. Like they just got slammed into this wall. And we needed to make sure that we always knew where Jewel was and we knew where Blue was. So it was very, very, very important to keep them on their hero color. So on the left, we've got her cyan tone reading. Him, he's, got, he's more like a royal blue color. And so getting those to always, always, always read and always making them feel like the same species, but just be different enough to where the audience can always tell them apart was so important though, to a shot like that. Um, black and white characters. So characters that are either uh, uh, black by design or white by design are a unique uh, element. So dark, uh, dark skin and dark value characters are best lit. Like you can see this in examples are best lit when their diffuse is toned down and they really hit like some strong specular highlights. Moonlight did an incredible job of this. So just hitting like these colored specks around on a character. Same thing with the um, Insecure, is that the name of this HBO show? Like these dark, like, uh, dark diffuse values and bright specular, colorful, saturated specular highlights are a great way to light a dark skin character. Think of Toothless from uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Beautiful example of that. Ferdinand, we had to do this a lot, like constantly balancing cool tones and warm tones. We're all, like almost every shot has cool spec on them and warm spec on them. Same thing with hair. So Hotel Transylvania, you've got to get like cool and warm specs and different saturated color specs on, on dark, objects to really get them to read and to get shaping in there. Um, a big one in a film that I just did, uh, Lance Sterling, uh, lots of, of, of colorful specs on him to get his shaping and his, his, his tone to read. Otherwise, if you hit um, a darker skin character, like you hit Toothless with um, a lot of diffuse light, it kind of takes them off their hero color and makes them look kind of washed out and not great. You have equal problems with characters that are white, like Snoopy. Snoopy in this film, like, man, when we were lighting him, he just lived in the snow. And it was like, come on, like a white character in snow, how do you get him to read? Um, you get the snow to be a little bit cooler of a white, but you don't, definitely don't want that to be dirty because that's a big problem. You want it to be white and not gray. So we, we have to like, you have to slightly adjust those values, just like a little bit cooler versus a little bit warmer on him. Big Hero 6, same problem, getting that tone just to be slightly different. I had a theory that at the end of this movie, they just got so frustrated lighting him that they just threw this bright red costume on him uh, just to <laughs> give them something so they didn't have to fight it all the time. So those are, are very complex, but um, also very important. And the last thing I wanna touch on is the eyes of the character before I get to your guys' questions. So the eyes of the character, this is so important. So to understand the, the anatomy of an eye, very basically, uh, the set, there, it's, it's three or four, four main parts. There's the pupil, the black dot in the middle, the iris, that's the colored part of the eye that we talked about. Someone has blue eyes or red or, or brown eyes or hazel eyes or whatever. And then sclera, that's the white surrounding part. And then on top of all of that is a cornea, which is just like a transparent film on top of our eye that's very, very specky and picks up all the reflections around us. It's important to know that because we always want those three elements to read. And also we want to um, be aware that the shape of the iris always picks up the opposite because it's kind of uh, concave, it kind of dips in. So the iris will actually pick up the opposite side. So in this case, we have light coming in from the screen left side. Um, because it's dimpled in, we actually see more light hitting the screen right side of the iris. So it's inverse. So like the screen left side of the, the sclera gets, the white part of the eye gets brighter, but the screen right part of the iris gets brighter. Now it's important to always have those three elements uh, completely distinct and separate because this is kind of my eye lighting checklist for most shots. Some films have different styles, but this is like my general go-to. 
Uh, sclera is shaped well and towards the key side. Iris is shaped well the opposite of the key side. All three areas are distinguishable. The sclera is the brightest part of the face without blowing out, without getting too white. Um, there's only one eye ding, and that lives at a, a, a 10 o'clock or a 2 o'clock position, kind of upper right or upper left, depending on what side the key is on. And the eye ding mimics the color and the shape of the key leg. That's kind of like my mental checklist that I go through when I'm dealing with eye dings. This is a great shot from Rio. Love this one. Um, got the key light coming in from the screen right side. You can see the inverse on the, um, on the iris. The, the sclera is being lit from the screen right side, but these, um, the iris is, is brighter on the screen left side. We've got an eye ding in that perfect two o'clock position that's showing that's the shape and the color of a window light. So I think that this is kind of like my example of good, of good, char of good character eye dings. You can also use the eye dings and eye lighting and eye reflections to kind of show what's going on in the room around you. It's a really powerful tool to connect the character to the surroundings. Um, yeah, and that's it. So let me hop into your guys' questions here. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and hopefully all of you are still with me because I apologize uh, for losing out on you. So go ahead and thank you, Clever. Clever found me in the new, in the new link over here, so that's great. Okay, let me just go into um, your questions here. And yeah, sorry, Sarah. Sorry, Clever. Video, uh, Zoom totally crashed in on me. I apologize. Um, okay, let me get into the questions. So first up, Jordan was asking, I um, mean, if you have more, add them to the, to the window here before and I'll get, to get to those. In your opinion, what's the main thing a student junior lighter uh, misses doing character lighting? I'm guessing the main one is eyes. If so, is there any more things that are normally missed? Uh, yeah, so the eyes, eyes are the first one. Um, that's, that's generally the, the biggest one that I'll see. Um, the other one is just like not creating enough mood in the character, like just not, not like pushing it far enough, just like really get after it. Like really, like we're, we're kind of in a medium that, that favors, um, like pushing the elements and really kind of like really getting after it and really going dynamic with it. Cause especially in the demo reel, you only have like a shot or two to really demonstrate it and you really have to sell it home. So, um, I would say, uh, I would say the eyes for sure. Definitely. Um, definitely the mood and then just kind of like making sure you're hitting all three of those elements, like getting good shaping, directing the viewer's eye, um, and, 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 um, and creating that mood. So I think that those are the three big ones. Um, and there's also like a lot of, um, like this, a big one too is just, I guess it's just not getting the character to pop off in the background enough. Um, creating an element back behind them or just like, like using vignetting and losing all the things that we talked about in our classes to just like really kind of zero in on that character and get them to read. Because again, that's what, that's what we're all going to be looking for in the films. Um, yeah. And that's, that's like I said, so, so I would definitely hit those points. Uh, let's see. Clever asked two questions. How do you deal with deem noise versus fur hair? Is it better not to use denoiser and increase samples or to use denoise? noise? Um, any tricks to, to not lose final detail on your hair or fur? Um, I generally don't use denoise. I just generally will, will adjust the samples. I don't know if others do it differently. In terms of not losing fine detail, it depends on the shot, but one of the things that I do, and it totally depends on render time, is I will up res a character with really fine hair if it's really important. Um, I, will, I will render them at twice the resolution that my final will be, because what ends up happening with hair that's difficult is that um, the hair follicle can fall between, below a single pixel in the render. Um, and then it gets kind of noisy, it gets kind of chattery because some frames it'll pick up, some frames it won't, and it'll just like look like it's swimming. So a good way to alleviate that is to render it twice the size, which is actually a four times bigger. You're able to alleviate that because now most of the fur bodies, depending on how close you are, will actually get above one pixel and will remain that way. And when you scale it back down, you won't be seeing that popping. You won't be losing that density. Uh, do you use EXR deep uh, in big feature animated films? We definitely use EXR files, um, that is, uh, we use the, you know, multiple channels and, and dig deep in that. Um, I haven't used any real deep compositing stuff. Um, deep compositing means, you know, like using Z-depth data within, within your file. Um, we don't 
do that, or we haven't yet just because we were able to generate ZDEP data independently and, and work from that. Um, and we just, we haven't had, or I haven't seen it, I, I need to. Um, now, ultimately, again, our biggest focus is making the best image possible. And I can definitely see a case where there would be a situation where we would want to use it. Um, but it just, ha like, I just haven't been approached with an individual uh, scenario like that. Um, but yeah, but definitely, definitely EXR files are what we, what we use to generate our data. Uh, it's great to see you guys again. I have one question. Have you heard of a practice that consists of using ray switch materials so that the calculation of the reflections is done with a low res texture saving render times? If so, how can you find out how to set it up? Thanks. Uh, totally depends on the render. Um, yeah, we, we can use, we've definitely used all kinds of tricks like that. I would say if you're doing that, uh, RenderMan's a really great one for that because you can customize your ray bounces. I would just check the RenderMan um, documentation because they have some some great resources for that there. Uh, that that would be my approach is to check the the initial documentation because each renderer will handle it differently. But um, but I think that RenderMan would would definitely be able to handle something like that. Now you don't necessarily need to use ray switches on. Um, on reflections, like one one trick that you can do to save render times is um, that I found is if you're doing um, any sort of like reflections or refractions. Okay, this is a big one, right? So if you've got a character with glasses, um, a big one to do would be to render the character without the lenses, um, and then render the character separate from the background. Because a big thing, a big calculation is the refraction values in the lenses of the glasses. And the other thing that stinks is like, if you put like, so then you layer that character into the, um, into the final comp and in the background, you start adding biometrics and atmosphere and defocus and all that good stuff. And like, you really make that look rich and nice. But the problem is, is that the original background is baked into the glasses so that when you're seeing that background refracted through, it looks totally different. So usually, so usually what I do in that situation is render the lenses separately. And instead of using the actual geometry as the refraction in that, I will put an image plane back there with the comped out background so that you're actually getting refracted elements from all the volumetrics and depth of field and stuff. It'll, that will really help out. That's not a super complex ray switching thing. That's just a pretty brute force compositing technique. And so that would be one example of that. But yeah, I would look into the renderer's documentation on that one because that, that, that could be something that most of them could do. Uh, hey Gloria, I uh, love this topic. I found that there are characters that are harder to light because of their shapes and sometimes because of some specific assets they have, props, clothes, hair, etc. Um, have you ever had to deal with something like this or what type of character do you find most challenging to light? Definitely um, my most challenging characters have been uh, Snoopy, uh, Ferdinand, um, any character, again, that's why I cover them specifically in our courses and have whole lectures devoted to lighting characters that are either all white or all black um, because they have their own unique elements, right? Like getting a white character to have shaping but not allow their shadow to go too dark and dingy and gray and make them look dirty is a real, real, real challenge. Um, I also find that characters with, um, there's, there's a few things that you find, like anything, anyone with a large brow because then you're trying to get light into their eyes and they're just constantly being blocked. Um, who was the character that we had that always wore a hat? That was, was that like, was that Charlie Brown had a hat in some shots? Um, that was a big one. So like anytime you have a character wearing a hat is always a little bit difficult because you got to push extra bounce light up in there. Um, another one is, is just any, and, and you see this a lot with like, if you buy a, uh, character on Turbo Squid or something, or or um, you'll see sometimes like there's like like little jagging things in the skin, um, like little imperfections that aren't like human imperfections. They're like weird geometry because that stuff will cast a shadow immediately, and you lose that like soft shaping on the cheeks and stuff. Um, and that one can be really bad. Uh, and then outside of that, just any character that's super angular. That's another one. Like um, that just like as a nose that kind of like bink bink and you're not able to get as much shaping onto them as you normally would. So that would be, um, that would be a big one too. Uh, all right, so hopping back into the live session here to give a couple questions. Um, okay, 
So Juan asks, uh, do you have time to show how to set up a key wrap? I want to make sure I'm doing it correctly. Uh, yeah, give me a second. I'll fire up Maya here and hopefully that doesn't make things crash. And I will do it on a super simple um, scene. So let me get that started. Give me just one sec. Okay, I'll go back to that in a second. And then Clever says, I do have a character bear running and running. Yeah, you're, by the way, if, oh, I guess it's in the student section. So all your students, check out what Clever's up to. It's really cool stuff. I do have a character bear running and running under trees. It is quite hard to manage how the light, uh, the light to focus on him during the running. Okay, I've totally had that before. Um, so a couple ways of handling that, that we've done in the past. So that was something that was big in Epic. We had lots of characters running in the woods. Um, the, the, I'm thinking back to your shot. So if, uh, if, if a shot is close up, and you don't necessarily see the ground and the light and dark shadows there. Um, and actually, if, even if you do, you, what, what I would do, what is I would do a trick of, um, instead of uh, trying to use the natural trees to create the shadows and the shaping that I would want in a particular way, I would uh, create light linking that would just kind of, um, hit the ground in the area w around where the action is and then paint gobos to um, hit the character at different points. And I would use the timing of the light. I would, I would increase the frequency depending on the drama. Like in yours, it's like a, it's like a pretty high drama chase. So I put a lot of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark uh, shapes in there. Um, and then I would match that gobo with the ground and the immediate surroundings with the character and then allow the surrounding trees in the background and stuff to actually get the, the, the light with proper light linking. Um, you can definitely give that a try and uh, see if that works out well for you. The other big one that you'll want to do um, is make sure that your characters are, when they're hitting the light patches, that they're getting that it, cause it's not just a key contribution. It's actually more bounce light too, right? Cause you got the key coming in, hitting the ground, bouncing up at them. And actually it's almost the bounce light more that sells uh, the key patch of light versus um, uh, versus the the non key part. So that that's a pretty big one for me too. So I would try that light linking one. It can get a little bit hairy, but as long as you have like a, a spotlight that is zeroed in on the area with like a soft edge, um, and then gobo in there, and then like that's where the character is running through, uh, you shouldn't really be able to discern it from the rest of the lighting. So give it a try and let me know how that goes. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely, definitely, definitely a challenge. Okay, let's see how Maya did opening up here. All right. Um, oh. My grid is off. Hmm. Okay. Okay, let me just, uh, actually, if I can share the screen so you guys can see what I am up to here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so where'd Maya go? Okay, hopefully you can see Maya here. If you can't, let me know. So ooh, it's being buggy, do you see this? Okay, so we've got the ground plane and a sphere here. Um, just go ahead and assign some default Arnold shaders to this. Um, surface shader, surface shader, okay. Go ahead and maybe just make a new camera or something, maybe that'll help. Oh, it's super janky. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so light, I'm gonna make a spotlight. Look through that selected, we'll zoom out here. Zero in on this, um, we'll go ahead and soften the edge. Uh, let's go ahead and zero it in there. So I'm using a sphere because this is a pretty good example of how this um, works out. Let's go back to the original and get this out of the way. Run this out. Okay, so let's go back to the spotlight, look through that, move this off to the side. So here, here's a pretty good example of this. Turn that exposure. Okay, do you see how um, 
in this example, we're getting like a super hard line along the middle here, right? Um, this, this happens on, on round characters and it's not always great. It's not always my favorite thing that happens. It's a pain in the butt. Um, it's not ideal. Let's go ahead and uh, open up this radius just a little bit. And I mean, you can see even when the radius is opened, like there's still a hard line there. Um, not ideal for character lighting. You, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna see some art. You're gonna, it's just unappealing. So what I usually do is, if this case, if this is the key light, what I will generally do is I will duplicate this and make this a key wrap or a key fill. Um, and then generally, what I do is because if I take this light and then move this, like this is my key light. Um, and what I want to do with this one is I want to just move the, I, like I'll move that back just a little bit more. And then I take the key wrap and move that a little bit forward. The first thing that I start to see is like, there's a double highlight ding um, there and there'll be like double shadows on some stuff. So what I, what I would do in that case is I would, I usually just, oh, oh, come on, come on. Come on. Take the specularity off of that. Um, oh wait, which one am I on? Yeah, kind of take the uh, the shadow density off of it a little bit, just to make sure that we're not getting um, double shadowing in that. And then what I do is, because now this is kind of overly lit, I'll take the key and I'll put that intensity at like maybe 70% of the original and the key wrap, I'll put that at about 30%. And now, I can kind of start to play with that a little bit more. And there's fall off now, but what we're not seeing is a super, super hard line. And we can actually make this radius a lot bigger too. And so now we can kind of start to see that, that fill light goes in and we're not getting that super harsh line. And instead we're getting a softer, you know, let's go ahead and turn this one up just a little bit. And now it's just creating a softer transition between those two planes as opposed to like the hard line. So that, that's basically how I use a key fill or key wrap um, on a character. It's just to, just to do it that way. All uh, right. Let me know if that, if that makes sense to you. Stop sharing here. And I will do that. So, so yeah, so like I said, I usually try and keep these a little bit shorter, but we, have a, we had a little technical hiccup. Uh, if you watch on YouTube, I'll go ahead and edit those together. Um, hopefully I will, hopefully I, the recording saved on that. Um, and that way you guys can see, because like I said, I could talk about this stuff all day. So again, if you are watching this on YouTube or on Facebook after the fact, and you want to ask me more questions, just go ahead and throw them in the, the comment window down below. I'll try and get to them. Um, yeah, no problem. And like I said, uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys put together for Friday. So Friday, future schedule Friday, we've got the live critique coming up. So get your work posted for that. Uh, heads up, Monday is a holiday. So we won't be doing a session on Monday. We'll be following up again on Wednesday. Um, and we'll be going from there. So let me know if you have any questions. And in the meantime, you all, happy lighting. All right, take care, everybody.